I'm Justine Young Gottschall. I am class of 94. I am the co managing partner of the Info Law Group and, far more importantly, have been volunteering along with Carol Lamb, who's here with us, for Stanford Women on Boards and specifically working very closely with the law school to help you know, raise awareness, educate, and help lawyers go on to boards. And I'm very excited about our panel today. It consists of lawyers who are also entrepreneurs and experienced board members having served on public, private, and nonprofit boards. I'm going to do quick introductions. To my right is Gail Moss, who is a Stanford undergraduate and Stanford Law School class of 1997, so perhaps a, a classmate of all of you. She spent several decades practicing law and representing technology companies, including serving as in-house counsel for several internet companies focusing on enabling growth and innovation through new technologies and strategic transactions. Gail serves on the board of directors of Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company and on the board of advisors for the venture startup studio Launch Factory. Thank you very much for being here. Linda Grace is a Yale MD and a Stanford JD class of 1993. She practiced three years at Wilson Cincini and then left law practice to start a biotech company with two scientists, which was ultimately sold to Eli Lilly. After working with InterWest Partners, investing in biotech and medical devices, she became CEO of a portfolio company, which was also ultimately sold. Gail, Linda serves on several corporate boards, ranging from Icon, which is a 40,000 plus employee company based in Ireland, to Corvus Pharmaceuticals, which is a 28-person company developing a new drug for difficult-to-treat cancers. She also serves on several nonprofit boards, mostly relating to science and medicine. And last but never least, we have Michael Venus. He was a Harvard undergrad and Stanford Law School graduate in 1998, almost my classmate in 1994. Uh, Michael was an associate and then a partner at O'Melveny, and then he joined the White House staff under President Obama in 2008 as special counsel to the president, and then served as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for International Trade. Since 2014, he has been the president and CEO of Monarch Global Strategies, a binational business advisory firm that focuses, among other things, on helping global His current boards include Edison International and Southern California Edison, Capital Group American Funds, and Amplify Inc. He also serves as the trustee at Stanford University and the new chair of the Audit Committee and the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, and I'm going to get us started uh, with a, an important question, I think, for anyone who's interested, which is what was your path to your very first for-profit board? And we can just start with Gail and get out of Great. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's a beautiful day, so thanks for being inside a law school classroom for, with us for an hour, and thanks for the intro, Justine. Um, um, the board I'm on is the first corporate board I was on, and I, I think it's true for many people. It's about networks. Um, and I was a personal friend um, with the CEO, but for a long time where we, the, you know, a lot of your friendships will also have business capacities. Um, and as I, I was also, and still am, a policyholder, which means a customer of the business, which is uh, the business um, provides professional liability insurance. Um, and that led to a lot of, you know, conversations about the practice of law, insuring lawyers, um, but I, I do think it's often true is that sometimes people are surprised to be asked, and I'll be honest that I was surprised to be asked. There weren't a lot of opportunities like there are right here where people were talking about how to obtain your first board. So I, it was a real um, credit to him that he thought of me, and I think it's relevant to know a little bit. I think he thought I would add um, generational diversity, um, subject matter diversity because of my tech fluency and my practices in tech law. Um, and I think it also was relevant that I brought gender diversity because the board really needed that. Um, so that was my path to the first board. And you know, we have some other answers. Thank you, Justine. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, my first board was in 
Uh, I think it had something to do with the fact that I was uh, at a venture firm that invested $10 million, and of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it kind of came along with that. This is a good way to go with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, you know, a lot of other board seats came along with investing, but after I left the venture firm, I think the main reason I started getting invited onto boards was because I had been a CEO and had taken a company public and had gone through all of the ups and downs of running a public biotech company. And so then that led to more opportunities. Great. Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be with you and with this great panel. Uh, Justine, thank you for moderating and bringing us together. Um, so I want to actually, I know the question was, what's your path to your first corporate board? But I want to start by saying my, really my path to my first corporate board was a lot of nonprofit board service because you learn a lot about corporate governance, especially, you know, not all nonprofits are little rinky dink nonprofits. Some of them are more sophisticated and that was actually an important element. But, um, uh, I think it was, uh, Gail mentioned the importance of networking. When I came out of the White House, when I came out of government, came back to California, uh, a close friend of mine was a very experienced corporate director, and I had made the decision, having worked with a lot of companies, both in my prior life as a lawyer and then as a commercial diplomat, working with a lot of CEOs on the, in, that are going after these big international contracts uh, in my post at Commerce. Uh, I, I realized that uh, board service was something that I wanted to eventually do. I didn't really know how to get there, uh, and I also knew that. Um, you know, as a lawyer, it was going to be more challenging in some respects because of the stereotypes that people have about lawyers. But my friend Linda, uh, who was on the CBS board and, and several other public company boards, was just a terrific mentor to me. And um, this is just a co happy coincidence of networking and good luck and good timing. Um, she was on the board of a hospital board in Los Angeles and had a big fundraising lunch, and she invited me, and I went. A lot of times I wouldn't go, you know, we all get these invitations and sometimes we say, ugh, I'm not going to go. But I went and she sat me at her table and lo and behold, the person sitting next to me was from Corn Ferry, a national headhunter who was in the middle of a search. And uh, it happened to be for Edison International. Edison is a Fortune 250 power company, uh, with, owns as one of its portfolio companies, Southern California Edison. And they happened to be looking for a director who... Uh, had understood regulated markets, had a good understanding of politics and the intersection of business and politics because we're a regulated industry, um, had corporate governance experience. Um, they didn't actually have uh, a lawyer. They, they had one outgoing lawyer and they, they were open to having a lawyer because being in a regulated industry, uh, it was useful to have that perspective on the board. Anyway, everything came together and I had no idea at the time. I just happened to sit next to her and um, one thing led to another, and a uh, lunch discussion led to a phone call, led to another discussion, and six months later, I was on the board. So definitely go to lunch. Um, <laughs> but, Michael, walk us through a little bit, because I think it's something that if you haven't had the opportunity, you know, it, it may not be self-evident, sort yeah. of how that board selection process works. Sure. And I'm, I've now been, you know, I think this is my seventh year on the Edison board and my seventh year as a, pri a public company director in other contexts um, because the, the, the old thing is it takes you, you got to start somewhere. It's like getting a credit. I remember when I was 16 years old and I wanted my first credit card and they said, we can't give you a credit card because you don't have credit. Like, well, how do I get credit? If I, if I need credit to get credit, how do I get credit? And somebody has to take a chance on you, right? Um, and once you get on that first board, it tends to lead to other opportunities. I've now, I serve on the NomGov committee for Edison. In fact, you know, I should be chairing that committee starting at the end of this year or early next year. And so I've been through a number of searches for directors. And it starts with really understanding, um, first of all, that it takes time. Uh, boards typically, unless there's a crisis, don't move quickly. Um, board selection, I'm, I'm putting this in the context of a public company board. Um, it's all run through the nom nominations and, gov and governance committee, and um, under different uh, listing, some you know some listing uh, uh, entities have different requirements. But a lot of institutional shareholders, the Black Rocks and Vanguards and State Streets of the world, want to see a board matrix, and so a lot of companies will have a board matrix, a, a skill matrix of what they're looking for, and so it starts by really understanding like. It starts with the company and what their needs are. And, and um, 
you know, in this day and age, for example, boards are looking for people with cybersecurity expertise because cyber threat is such a real issue for so many companies. Um, and so in any case, the, the process is that the nominating governance committee really starts by assessing what the needs are, what our current makeup of the current board is, um, there's, and, and what are the skill sets that are missing. Every board will have industry experts, people that really understand the core business of the business. Um, every board, almost every board will have generalists who, are, who bring, you know, global perspectives or other perspectives or the perspectives of a customer or of an important stakeholder or constituency. Um, if you're in a regulated industry, people that have experience, you know, navigating regulatory issues either as counsel or um, through business. Uh, there, there's core functions you see over and over again. Public company CEOs and CFOs tend to be really uh, strong candidates because every, at the end of the day, the, under, the, the function of the board really is to be, apart from hiring and firing the CEO, you're really there as a resource to the, to the, to the management team. And so it's the, the NOMGov committee is always looking at what are the, what's the skill set that we need to make available to the management team. And, and so that can run the gamut. Um, most boards will use uh, headhunters, you know, the big firms, the corn fairies of the world. Um, there, there's a number of them, and I encourage you, if you're interested, to really understand that process. Um, there is bias towards existing directors, uh, so like I said about credit, you know, you gotta, you gotta be on a board to get a board, but not exclusively. And especially given the imperative these days with, uh, for diversity, people want to see gender balanced boards. I'm very proud of the fact that at Edison we have an equal number of men and women. We have an extremely diverse board and that didn't happen by accident. It's a real value of the company, of, of the board itself. We've gone out and deliberately looked for because we don't subscribe to the idea that there are trade-offs between diversity and quality. Like there are amazing women, there are amazing minorities, there are amazing people um, and, and you just have to, to, to take the time. So. The process really is run by the nominating and governance process. There is a networking effect. Knowing people who are on those boards, who are in those roles, is helpful just for advice. Having a headhunter and working with them, there are a lot of headhunters out there that, are, that that's what they do. They have board practices, and you can find them. Um, a lot of them run conferences that you can attend. If you don't have board experience, there's um, some certification like the National Association of Corporate Directors and others. There's a Latino Corporate Directors Association. There's an LGBT uh, Corporate Directors Association, you know, the Rock Center here at Stanford. There's a lot of uh, corporate director education. And, and sometimes if you don't have public company board experience, you can signal your seriousness about being a director by going through and completing some of those certifications and some of those boards. So, the other, the other benefit of that is that you put yourself in the mix and you get on these uh, lists. The New York Stock Exchange and OISC, NASDAQ, they all have uh, board recruitment functions where they will provide lists of, of eligible directors to companies that are looking for directors. So I wish I could tell you that there's like um, some secret code or some secret path, but it really, like many things in life, it's a, it's a function of being the right profile or what a particular board looks like. It, it's a network effect, having the right relationships, and sometimes, as you heard from my story, that can happen just But I also will tell you that I've seen people that are really intentional about putting themselves in the stream of like boards in the board line. And with persistence, they often end up on boards. So let's talk because we're really, there really are barriers for lawyers, right? I mean, I think, um, well, you got very lucky to go to lunch is our great takeaway here. I, I do think you can find that some of the board head hunters don't necessarily know what to do with lawyers in terms of placing them unless they happen to have been asked for a very specific skill set that you have. So let's talk about that a little bit. Linda, I'll kind of start with you, or sorry, Gail, I'm going to start with you. What are some of those barriers and how do we get around them? Yeah, right. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about what Michael said and then we're going to go to the barriers. But Michael, Michael gave a really great perspective on, I think, public company um, and the rigor that's put behind board matrices and the use of recruiters. 
I think it's really great for everybody to remember that a lot of companies, um, even a lot of them right now, they want to conserve on those recruiters. And they also sometimes think that the recruiters show them the same people, people who are already on the same boards. And so um, I know our company, we, I'm on Nom and Gov, and we get scrappy and creative. So don't be surprised if it's not only that if you would like to be on a board to be intentional, but don't be surprised that some of the people you'll meet will be people who are on boards in Nom and Gov capacities who are being intentional about expanding their network. Because that's what I've been doing in order to be able to introduce new directors to our company because we have an aging board and we've been looking for um, people who are diverse, but diverse because they're going to bring a different capacity. We need potentially some people who have different financial skills, different strategic skills, different public policy areas, and also we've wanted to expand a little bit about who, rep who represents our customers, our customer base. You want to have people in the room who are reflect your customers. So I wanted to kind of flip it that you can be intentional, but you can also imagine that in your, who might you meet out there that is intentionally sitting next to you at lunch or at a networking event. So the more you go to events like this, the more you're going to be seeing people not only who would like to serve on a board, but want to expand their networks for their current boards. Um, but to the barriers, I think it's, a, it's true. I think that there's um, everybody, I think, who might have Barriers. There might be kind of three buckets I was thinking, but one is unique to lawyers. I think any individual who wanted to serve on a board, there might be narrow skill sets, but I think that applies to everybody and not just lawyers. There might be um, also limited networks or limited visibility, but that doesn't just apply to lawyers. I think that the area that might apply uniquely to lawyers is about perception of lawyers. Um, I think that the two perceptions that lawyers do have to work to overcome are that they are particularly risk averse. Maybe their training makes them more risk averse than any other discipline. I don't know, maybe, maybe you could say auditing. Maybe you could come up with financial auditors would be more risk averse, but it would be, we're gonna be in the, on, the, on the lever, we're gonna be perceived as being the risk averse. And then the other um, barrier would be the perception that our role is as a counselor with good business judgment, but not as a decision maker in the room. Um, and you sit on a board, you're going to need to be a debater and a creative thinker, and, but ultimately a decision maker. You're not replacing the management's decision, but occasionally the management is going to look to you to vote, or they're really going to look to you to strongly advise, having very strong opinions, as though it kind of, um, kind of approximates having a vote. So I think that lawyers. I think that more recruiters and more people looking at boards are recognizing that lawyers are not, they're not only risk averse. I, I view myself as being the opposite. I want to be the lawyer in the room that says, let's take that smart risk. Innovation and growth won't happen in the industries I serve and in, in technology industries without embracing risk. So I think there are ways to overcome, to actually not be the most risk averse person in the room, but it doesn't mean that the perception doesn't need to be overcome. And the same for showing that you've been a decision maker and that you are, or, or it can also help to show if you haven't been a singular decision maker, I am rarely in my practice a singular decision maker, but to really have stories to demonstrate that you work cross-functionally and that you are in a decision making team that's not just with lawyers. So I work with product people, engineers, and financial people, sometimes also talent people, that will be on something, a project I'm working on and we have to decide together and I do feel like the opinion I give gives equal weight. So I, those are the stories I can sort of tell about being a decision maker. Do either of you want to add about anything about the perceptions or barriers? I, I think that's all true. Um, I mean, I think the basic skills of a lawyer are very relevant to board work. Um, being able to think through complex issues, being able to look at both sides before making a decision being articulate, being able to read really dense documents. Mm -hmm. um, but those aren't big selling points, because I think, in general, most boards think that they can do those things. <laughs> and also that they have outside counsel that will do that, or, or inside counsel. So I think it is very helpful to also bring a specific substantive area of expertise, whether it's cybersecurity, ESG, um, different governance issues, um, to be able to bring that to the table, I think that does help. I definitely agree with um, your comment about, especially for small companies, they, they don't love Headhunter <laughs> so much. Mm -hmm. They're expensive. Um, and, and so I think in many ways, they're getting away from that. And, and for a first board, I think you know it is good to start with a small company. You'll get a lot more hands-on experience. Um, you'll really get to know the management team. You know, I think in general, I find that there's an 
inverse relationship between the size of the company and the amount of work that the oh, board yeah. is. <laughs> you know, my 40,000 person uh, company that I'm going to Ireland for this afternoon is hardly any work except for flying to Dublin. Uh, but a little scrappy companies around here, you know, they need help. And so you get very involved and you really learn uh, a lot about the nitty gritty of, of what boards can do. Um, I just want to add one point to the go to lunch recommendation. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to my uh, classmate on the day I went to a dinner and sat next to him, and that led to my most recent board that I joined recently. Um, Bob is their outside counsel. So um, not only go to lunch, but go to dinner <laughs> and get to stay in touch with your classmates because a lot of them are the outside counsel for companies that need new board members. They're lucky to have I mean, just to, just to build on the barrier of the point, I do think the perception of lawyers is a hard one to overcome, especially if you're a current practicing lawyer. I think, that, um, just to be honest, I think that current practicing lawyers are viewed with a certain lens in it. And then there are lawyers and then there are lawyers. There are litigators and there are transactional lawyers. If you're a, a corporate lawyer and you've done a bunch of deals and you have a particular <coughs> set of expertise, um, that is different than if you're a litigator. I'm a litigator. And what I find is that the perception of litigators, Carol, you know, is, uh, is one that like, you know, if you ask a question, this isn't a deposition, right? <laughs> or if you, you know, on the other hand, Boards frequently run into very tricky issues and very complex issues. Carol you know, and I serve on the Board of Trustees together at Stanford, and as all of you know, we've gone through some difficult challenges. And it's no surprise that Carol chairs the, chaired the audit committee and was on the special committee uh, doing the investigation into the university president. There is a skill set that's really valuable. So I think there's a, among more sophisticated directors, I think there's a real appreciation and recognition that you need a broad skill set. But we'd be naive if we didn't acknowledge that um, it is a, that perception is, is hard to overcome. Um, the other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, I think it is important, candidly, if, if, if the more broadly you can present yourself, um, and, and, and many lawyers do lots of things over the course of their careers. They serve in government. They manage large agencies. That's what I happen to do. Management experience is actually very relevant, having to deal with everything from HR issues and hiring and firing decisions to, um, broad strategy uh, in managing a P&L, even if it's in the public context versus the private context, although there's a big difference, obviously. Uh, so I think that, you know, I'm, I'm glad, Justine, you said that we have to be realistic, that I think lawyers in particular do face barriers to getting on boards because of perceptions of lawyers, but I think it really comes down to how you um, what substantively what your, the breadth of your experience is, and you have to be honest with yourself. Do I really have broad experience outside of the lane of just being, a, just being a lawyer? And second, how do I talk about and market myself in a way that, you know, really conveys the breadth of that expertise? So, I, I want to dive in a little bit deeper, if we can, right, and take on this a little bit, but we talked about it a little. You know, about really ways to think about it to overcome those things, right? What are some selling points for lawyers? What are some ways to sort of you know, in addition to perhaps you've got a certain skill set, and, and I think we should talk a little bit about how that might be different, right? If you're coming as a GC, if you're coming out of government, if you're coming out of private practice, but then how to sort of start talking about it a little differently. Because I do think that while we may have to be slightly on the defensive, right, if there's an assumption of us as being too conservative or not having certain skills. Being on the offense about what we bring to the table is always a better way, right? So, Gail, I'll let you jump in and whoever else wants to, and I threw a lot out there, so. Yeah, there's um, a lot on my shoulders because I am the one who's the practicing lawyer, <laughs> yeah, which, is, so. which is what both Michael and Linda, I think, are illuminating something, that lawyers who transition out of practicing law are gonna have the management skills that, that the boards will look for. So, as a practicing lawyer, I think, you know, you have to deal with the two perceptions I got, but then each person needs to think about what is your, you know, you're gonna be, you're gonna need to be, for most boards, a little bit of a T, they call it a T, where across, you're gonna have to say, I have some breadth. You know, I don't just litigate. I think, I do, you know, so where is your breadth? You know, and now I have breadth because of having been on a board, but I suppose if I, how much did I have before I was a director? Much less. 
you know, much less. A lot of my breadth has come from serving as a director, but you're going to need to think about what do I do that isn't just being a lawyer, but as a lawyer, you're going to definitely have a strength here talking about the offensive, is you're going to go deep on something. What do you go deep on? For example, there's a lot of lawyers now who have extensive practices that relate to ESG. I mean, ESG is a, a legal, la heavy laden area, but it is also an area that boards are seeking. So there's going to be overlaps between legal depth and what boards are seeking. Uh, seeking excuse me, cyber is another area. I think that that's a strength in my practice. I do a lot of privacy. Privacy is something that Justine is extremely strong in. Privacy and security related areas are also where, pe where boards are seeking that technical depth. So I think that's a way to be on the offensive, is if you've only practiced law, you may not have the, the across breadth yet of management, but you will have the expertise and focus on that. Um, so I agree with all of that. I think in terms of selling yourself, it's really important to be able to talk about what you have done in very specific terms that are, is going to be relevant to this board. Um, if you are... Um, you know, with an expert in structuring complex transactions, and that's something that this company does, you need to talk about the, you know, some of the transactions that you've successfully engineered. If you're an ESG expert, whatever, you know, I think just like any other sort of sales pitch, you've got to sort of have your bullet points down, both on your resume and in your head, and, um, and be able to show them that you've done it before, even though it was as a lawyer, it's something that will be helpful to them. I would just add to that that, I mean, so subject matter expertise is very relevant, and everybody on the board brings a different subject matter expertise. I had a lot of experience in international work, and on some of the boards I serve on, that international perspective and that global markets experience is actually very relevant to our business. Not so much for Edison, although we do have an international business, but some of the other boards I work on. So subject matter expertise and really highlighting your particular subject matter strengths, I think, is, is very valuable. Second, um, we haven't talked about board culture. And, and this is, there's an intersection between board culture and the perception of lawyers that gets really tricky. Because I would say in my now you know seven years, I've gone through probably 15 director searches across the board. The um, the thing that I hear over and over and over, the first and last question always is, how will this person fit into our culture, into the board culture? Because you will go through as a board uh, challenging times. Maybe you have to fire a CEO, or there's a public controversy, or a scandal, or uh, a hostile takeover, or a shareholder activism, or there's a million things that can happen that, re that are very stressful on a board. And the thing that the board cares the most about, even beyond everything we've talked about, in my opinion, is board culture. Is this person going to fit in to the, the, the dynamic that we have as a small board? Most corporate boards are like 10 or 11 people. Some are a little bigger. And so you got to get along. And the concern always about a lawyer, especially about litigators, is are you going to be too aggressive? Is this person, what are the person's interpersonal skills? And so really be also being able to develop a narrative about situations where you've worked effectively in teams and having people in your reference network that will talk to you about about your behavior your cultural contribution to the board how are you you know are you collegial um, do you take things personally do you get your back up too easy are you too aggressive are you too are you are you not assertive enough uh, are you willing to take chances are you captured by the by management are you willing to speak up and speak truth to power when needed i mean there's a million little things that you try to read for in an interview process and when you check references um, and i think lawyers can sometimes suffer on that front because the the task of being a lawyer sometimes requires us right i'm looking at a former federal prosecutor if you're a former prosecutor in your role as a prosecutor, you've got to take on a certain personality. If you're a litigator or a trial lawyer, or even just a high-end deal lawyer, you're doing these complicated, difficult deals. It's always trying to find this balance, but I think board culture is really important in understanding board culture and how you, how you market yourself as a team player is really important. The other thing is, which relates, I think, also to governance is um, the other fear I hear articulated about lawyers is, is this person going to come in and think they're the GC? They don't want another GC. They have a highly competent public, we're talking about even public and private companies. We don't need another lawyer. We have a lawyer. 
and so knowing how to walk this line between being a resource to management and a resource like on the edison board we've had a lot of wildfire litigation because of the wildfires in california i have a great working relationship with our general counsel who is a brilliant lawyer who i learn from every day but i really appreciate it when adam calls and we have a you know because i'm one of the only experience you know, I was a Melvin partner I was a litigator we'll talk about our trial strategy sometimes we'll talk about our litigation strategy as it relates to something and I and I'm really conscious of like not trying to tell him how to manage the cases but just <coughs> listening to him understanding like what he's concerned about how does my experience just offering a fresh set of eyes but but you know as they say um, what is the expression uh, eyes in hands out you know like being really good at at issue spotting and and, um, and and being a resource, but not really not second guessing or questioning the lawyer's role. And I think that's a concern that you have to address when you're a lawyer looking at um, going onto a board. So I want to shift gears a little bit because I think we should look at the other side of the coin in terms of challenges of being on boards as a lawyer. Right? We have very busy jobs, we have a lot going on, and there are other considerations, and I think it depends on role as well, right? Obviously, probably incredibly difficult to serve on a board while you're serving in the government, for example, but um, I think we should, let's talk about that a little bit. What are some of the challenges you need to think about while you think about your own timing, even if it's something you're sure you want to do? When is the right time, and what are some of those considerations? Um, so, well, first of all, conflicts are real, and one of the biggest limitations if you're still a practicing lawyer, most law firms, frankly, won't let you serve on a board. There are very few that will, but most, in my experience, will not. So that's, a, that's if you're at a law firm, the odds are your firm general counsel is, and your management committee is not going to let you do it because of the potential for conflicts. Uh, they don't want to lose an opportunity to represent a company or, uh, or an adversary to that company because you're on the board. Um, so th I think that's a that's a constraining reality right there. Um, time uh, these you know this in this post Sarbanes Oxley world like you know the days of being a you know rubber stamp director if they ever existed certainly don't exist anymore and there's real liability you carry and uh, institutional investors and shareholder activism and. You know, the fiduciary duties are real, and the board prep is serious. I mean, it, it's like getting a, 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 a big, it's all electronic now for the most part, but, the, but there's like thousands sometimes of pages of reading that you do before a quarterly board meeting on a wide range of issues. Um, so I think, you know, time commitment, the conflicts issue, and then I would also say, especially if you're not a transactional lawyer that's been dealing with... Um, deals and financial statements, there's a certain amount of financial literacy you have to have as a corporate director. You gotta be able to read the financial statements, read a 10Q, a 10K, understand you know, financial accounting, GAAP, or some companies are, have non-GAAP accounting, but there's a certain amount of like corporate finance. Uh, public companies in particular are constantly going to the public markets, um, you know, selling uh, equity, uh, selling loans, uh, financing, different, you know, whether it's infrastructure or capital or whatever, these are things that you got to understand. And um, so I think the, the barriers and the challenges might be the time, the conflicts, and then your own preparation in terms of financial literacy to, to be an effective director. And I want Gail and Linda to jump in, but that is just a perfect time to announce that we are going to do a webinar on financial basics um, for lawyers who want to serve on boards, and hopefully that's in December. December 14th is when we have the schedule for the last right now. So keep your ears open for that, because I think a great event that is something we all have to wrap our heads around if we haven't otherwise had that chance. Gail, Linda, do you have other things to people should think about? And uh, well agree with everything Michael said and on conflicts obviously you would not want to serve on the boards of two companies that are competitors and that comes up if you're in a discrete space like healthcare or biotech oftentimes you know two companies are working on the same indication and that is something to be avoided um, and then also if you're on public company boards there is a a limit to how many you can be on because ISS and Glass-Lewis 
the shareholder uh, watchdogs keep track. And they know if you're on more than four public company boards, <coughs> even if you are doing a great job, um, they will advise shareholders to vote against you at your next ele election. So I think, um, you know, some people kind of skirt that rule, but uh, for public company boards is probably as much as you should do. So the question was, is it a good time when things not like something like that? Well, yeah, sort of the considerations we should give. Yeah, about when to really dive in, because let's be honest, a board search is an intensive yes. process you have to put in the world. Yeah, so refreshing on the question made me think about something is that it's almost like we're talking about it as though you've got to dive in the deep end right away. You know, um, but honestly, that's not always realistic to obtain, and nor might that be what you would want. And so, one of the pathways that we haven't mentioned yet, although we, there was a lot, there was a good mention of doing nonprofit work. One of the other steps that I think is really almost more viable and can be more fun and interesting is to be on an advisory board. Um, and on a board, they call it a board of advisors. There's just a, a very wide range in the way that companies, you, private companies, will use boards of advisors. No two are going to be the same, um, but you could step in and step out with a little bit easier. For example, if it's not a good fit, you find out that you know it's not quite as serious as resigning from a board, uh, a, a fiduciary board role, um, and you get to really roll up your sleeves and help the business. Is what I, I find with a little bit of a touch of not it, it's. It's going to touch on some governance issues because sometimes those companies might not have a, 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 a governance that is beyond investors. They're going to have investors that help with governance, but they sometimes do want an independent perspective, but they don't yet have an independent director in a fiduciary capacity. So one of the ways that you can balance this dilemma of conflict, limited time, and not sure you even want a fiduciary um, director's role is to seek out companies that are looking for advisors and even raise your hand and put yourself out there like, do you need advisors? Are you looking for advisors? Here's why your business interests me. Um, so um, that happened to me in the past, and now I'm in conversation for another one, and I, I find that is to be a really great way to serve. I agree. I've, I've done the same thing, yeah. and, and it does help a great deal because you can deal with the complex issues and kind of get that through a lot easier. Yes. But I would also hesitate, again, it's for complex reasons and timing reasons, I've never done more than one at a time. And I think that it, it can be difficult to do more than one at a time. But Michael, please. I just want to add, since I think, uh, Gail, that was a really excellent point. We've been focusing a lot on public company boards, and the truth is they're hard to get, and it's hard to start there. But since we're in the Silicon Valley, um, I, I really, and many of you, I presume, probably know people in private equity. A, a, a great way to get private company for-profit board experiences through private equity portfolio companies. Every private equity firm sit, you know, has portfolio companies. And while it's true that most, uh, or, or, or venture, also private equity and venture, while most non-public private companies, the boards will typically be uh, investor-driven, shareholder-driven, um, I, I've, I serve on two private company boards that are, that, as an independent director, and um, at different stages. One is kind of an early round, post uh, Series A, and another one we just closed a almost $300 million Series C round. And uh, I think, Linda, you mentioned that be careful because the smaller the company and the earlier stage the company, the more work it can be because these companies are the, they don't have the infrastructure to support the board in the way that a big public company does. They're more needy, frankly. They're like going through fast-paced change and the board, they're looking, if you're on the board, they're looking to you for help. You're there not to look pretty and be a governance expert. They want your network, they want your Rolodex, they want your expertise, they want your time, they want your advice, and it can be really time consuming. But, uh, number one, some of them can be really um, successful and you get lucky and they become public company boards and there's you know liquidity events. But more importantly, it really gives you really legitimate governance experience at different stages of corporate development that you can then use to talk about and it gives you some credit when you then go to the public company board search and you can say, yes, I've been on a, you know I've, I've, I've done this and here's what I've done. 
So let's talk a little bit about nonprofits, right? Because I know that a lot of people are driven um, for personal service reasons to do nonprofits, but I think that question comes up a lot, right? Can nonprofit board service lead to other types of board service? So we should talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, I, absolutely, it can. I've been, my goal is to get some point is that you started out with nonprofits. And, um, you know, even though a nonprofit is a nonprofit, it still generally has revenues and expenses and financials to pay attention to and management issues and an audit committee and all of those things that are transferable skills to a for-profit. Um, it also is a great place to make connections. You know, there are you know, usually interesting people on those boards. Oftentimes, some of the big donors are on the board. They may have interesting connections. So along the, you know, go to lunch, go to dinner, <laughs> definitely consider a nonprofit board. Um, but make sure it is a mission you believe in. <laughs> um, because they do, they end up taking a lot of time as well. Many of them want a financial commitment from board members. So you really do have to believe strongly in the mission and not just see it as a way to start getting board experience. And there are nonprofits, and there are nonprofits. And I mean, again, in the spirit of being candid, right? This is a group of Stanford graduates, Stanford law, uh, some Stanford law graduates. Um, you know, you're. There, I absolutely endorse, I'm on a local regional foundation board, I absolutely endorse working with local community organizations for the pure good of helping your community. So let me just make that clear. But in terms of preparation for a corporate board or a big board, you know, the ideal would be, there, there are some very sophisticated nonprofit boards out there, as you know, uh, national nonprofits, philanthropies, foundations. And to your point, Linda, you know, the people, your colleagues on those boards are typically people who, Many of them are public company directors, and it is not at all uncommon to, um, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to your fellow directors, and you're in the middle of a search, and you're like, hey, I'm looking for somebody. Do you know so it Just conversations happen, and when you're, the point is to get yourself to be top of mind, uh, and that's just a great network. I, I don't want to say that like in a, in a gross Machiavellian way. Don't do it for that reason. But understand that big national nonprofit boards or regional boards, um, first of all, they have real governance issues uh, that, that, that really can help you. You're going to deal with uh, all the same issues in a different context, at a different scale, but they're, they're very relevant to what fundamentally what you're dealing with. And, you, and again, um, a, a, a common concern about everybody, but, as, but including lawyers, is do they really understand that line between management and board, do the board governance? Are they going to be too inclined because as a lawyer you're trained to really jump into the weeds and solve the problem? Do you understand where that line is? And being able to say and, and talk to your fellow directors about how you played that role on a big national nonprofit board I think is, is really helpful. I would also say whatever nonprofit you join, take the opportunity to build up the skill set. Right, it was, I joined a local children's theater board because of my love of theater, but I had the opportunity to serve on an audit committee. That's an experience I was not going to get anywhere else as a practicing lawyer, right? So it's really an opportunity to dive in and get the skills that you might be missing um, and be able then to talk about that experience and how in fact you do have that experience even if a typical lawyer might not. Um, I want to ask each of you to give, you know, one or two pieces of advice that you wish you'd been given when you started your board journey. Okay. Great. So I think probably I would have liked to have known a little bit more about the lack of onboarding that will sometimes be provided and how you should exercise self-help. So this is actually, you know, when you're about to start, but this isn't about getting the board. This is about you have been appointed to a board. What will happen next? 
sometimes you'll just go to your first meeting. Um, and so there's now a lot more talk, I think, and, and certainly public company boards pay a lot more attention to onboarding, um, but now I'm trying to help my company spend more time on it. I think in smaller companies and boards of advisors, like onboarding is not really an expression. I am talking about a more formal board where they will have, you know, maybe between, you know, eight and 12 members and there'll be formal meetings. Um, make your own onboarding is what I would say um, for, that, for that. But then the other one is in the meetings itself, I think it took me a while to understand the value addition that you bring with generative questions. Um, and as opposed to uh, probably a lot of the beginning people being quiet and then in a break asking all the questions I had. Um, or before and after, which is a smart thing to do. Before and after, get to know the management, ask them the questions you want. But during the meeting, and now I spend time when I prepare for how, what am I going to do? We're going to be meeting for three hours. There's a lot of us around the table. The, the smartest way to use that time will probably be not with a question I can answer before, after, or during a break, but it will be smarter to use everybody's time with a generative question. So I think that was something that I've learned along the way. The time that will generate uh, really the management thinking about a challenge or an opportunity and get everybody else a little bit aligned on I'm not even aligned. Maybe you'll start a question that might take many meetings to resolve. You don't necessarily need to throw a bomb in the middle of a meeting. I don't mean a generative question in that way. I don't mean something that blows something up or the derails thing. I, I, it has to be kind of a real positive, something you think is going to move this company forward in some way. So that's the, what I want to say about that. Yeah, no, I think that's a great piece of advice. Um, there are a lot of board members who like their airtime, want to make comments that uh, everybody will listen to, but it isn't necessarily productive. Whereas I think having more of a questioning stance, trying to get to the heart of a matter is really important. Um, I guess in terms of advice, I would say, similarly to what I just said about nonprofits, just make sure that whatever board you are thinking about joining, that you believe in the company, the mission, the CEO. You're going to be spending a lot of time, uh, most likely, with that CEO and the other board members because there will always be surprises. I think um, I haven't had any boards where there wasn't some, you know, oh no moment, uh, whether it was, you know, we. Uh, a drug failed, or the company's getting sued for something, or there's, uh, you know, war in Ukraine, and we have a lot of clinical sites in U Ukraine. Um, there's always going to be something, a global pandemic. So just, you know, prepare yourself for that. Know, and, and, you know, it can be very rewarding to work through those things, but just know that you're going to roll up your sleeves and you really have to make sure that this is a company and a management team and a board that you feel like you're ready to commit to. I would say two things um, in terms of just practical advice. One is just be prepared for how long the process can take. It, it really can take. I mean, I, it made it, I made it sound like, you know, I just happened to show up for lunch and, you know, six months later I was on a board. It wasn't like that. I mean, I had, I had been very intentional and deliberate about trying to find a board opportunity, and it was three years later that this happened. Okay. Uh, and I sometimes think it's like a sliding doors. But like, what if I hadn't been at that lunch? Might it, it might have taken another who knows how long. So, it's it's this is one of the few things in life you can apply for. I mean, it, there's no clear path, right? You just have to be top of mind, either from a friend that's on a board, somebody who knows you. You you have to come into the mix somehow, and so. Being patient with that and understanding it can take time is, I think, really important. The second thing relates more to when you're actually on the board, and this is something you can start working on now. Um, and I don't mean this to sound too pedantic or prescriptive, but it, it, it was a really, it's been a really insightful process for me. I mentioned board culture earlier, and Linda just referenced, you know, this idea and building off of Gail's comment about generative questions. Um, boards are really unique creatures. They're really unique entities, and um, you know some big public company boards, you know, have big names and big egos and big personalities. And every board has its own culture. As lawyers, in particular, I think our professional training and preparation is such that we like to get to the heart of the matter quickly, right? You know, if there's a problem in a deal document, let's focus on that issue. As a litigator, like it's my you know training to like 
question and get to things quickly and and that can that has its place but uh, what I have learned and I won't say the hard way because I don't think I've had a problem with it but it's it's but I've experienced it is there's a lot to be said for your own personal preparation and reflection on how do you go about joining a very small elite group of people and finding your place in that small organization and learning how to ease into it, taking time to learn the business, to listen more than you talk, to, you know, when you do use your airtime to make sure there are questions that are important questions, not just questions that you think you need to ask so that people can see you participating. There, it's a weird process because there's this dual anxiety. If I sit there and say nothing, maybe people will think I'm not prepared or not engaged, right? Even if I'm just actively listening. But so that, well, on that note, Michael, we're going to give them the opportunity. We're going to put you on the spot to ask good questions. So opening it up for questions. Don't be shy. He didn't mean that. Um, <laughs> does in terms of helping to prepare a bio. They do a lot of workshops. They have templates. So, and it is very different from a regular bio. Um, but I so, believe the templates are available online, yeah, but yeah. those are not necessarily uh, geared towards lawyers, right? And so there's, right, but it is it is a good place to start. And, yeah. and that is open to everybody online. So, I know we had a question over here. Sure, it's sort of a different direction than I also came late, so apologies if this was discussed. What about board compensation, equity versus uh, cash? You know, what have you seen? I mean, obviously, if you're trying to get on the board, you don't go in and say, you know, give me X, Y, and Z. But, you know, talk a little bit about your compensation experience. Um, sure, I'll jump in. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not usually much of a negotiation. <laughs> um, there... For a small private company, it's much more focused on equity. Um, the you know generally small companies are cash strapped. They're you know they pay a little something, uh, but it's it's nom the cash is nominal and it is mostly equity. Um, and usually options. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, for public companies, you know there is much more of a standard uh, cash and equity retainer. Uh, small biotech company probably pays uh, a base retainer around thirty-five to 40000 plus a little more for committee work. Um, and then the equity uh, is either something like, you know, ten to 15000 options. Sometimes it's RSUs, actual shares that will vest. Um, Every you know every year, uh, and the you know the worth of that all depends on the uh, how the company does, obviously. And then a bigger company actually does pay you know a fair amount more than that. Um, but I would say uh, you know generally the compensation is is there, uh, but it it just depends a lot on the the size of the company and the stage of the company. Okay. For these smaller companies, what are you saying in terms of RSUs as a percentage of the business? Um, you know, for a regular board member at, at the when they join, it would be something under 1%. Um, you know, it would be half percent, quarter percent, and then it gets, you know, re-upped. Bob, Bob, would you yeah, like to speak yeah, to that? Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, 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 I was going to say a yeah. lot less. Well, for the whole board, one. 
for the whole board to find out. Well, just yeah, also just quick on, on public company compensation, you look up any public company's proxy statement, it's in right. there and you'll see. And for big, you know, Fortune 250 or above, the average compensation in the cash tends to be anywhere from 100 to $150,000 in cash, and usually a comparable amount of equity, which comes usually in the form of restricted stock units or phantom shares. For private companies, it's all over the board. It's all over the board, and I agree. It's, I mean, in my experience, the cash comp is very low, and it's all about the options. And the options just are you know, wh what stage of development the company is. The earlier you get in, the better. Um, you know, in one private company I'm on, it's a venture back company. I was in early, and we're much further along. And it, you know, that it's a, it's incredible how, if you base it on our last valuation, our last round of fundraising, how much that equity is worth today. But um, it, it's all over the board, and I don't find that there's that much room to negotiate. Yeah. Um, I have a question, of, a two-part question about boards and advisors, uh, which is kind of presented as a, uh, a lower risk uh, uh, place to get some experience. Uh, and I'm wondering if it's universally Except that it seems like everybody says, well, there's no fiduciary obligation that goes along with being a member of the board of advisors. Is that uh, black letter law? I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure there is, but if it is, I'd like to know your thoughts on that. And also, I'm curious about uh, lawyers who serve on board of advisors and also serve as lawyers to the organization that they're advising. Uh, which, it, you know, is it safer to do that if there's no fiduciary? Obligation. Was the second part you'd be both the lawyer for the organization and serving on a, as an advisor as well? Right. I don't know how to speak to that. I think at all times a lawyer should always remember their ethical obligations. Almost, they, they're not the same as fiduciary obligations, but they're often going to drive similar activity and similar outcomes. But I think if you are not in a board meeting and not recorded in board meeting as a director, you could not be you could not be for those decisions in those meetings you could not have had fiduciary responsibility for them most of the activities that i find i'm doing as a board advisor both for a venture fund and its portfolio companies is really related to them finding product market fit finding their networks thinking about when they should raise or not raise who would be a strategic investor so there's uh i haven't really even felt that there's been i've had to ask that question you're asking now and if you feel you can tell if you feel that the decision make the decisions that are coming to you are have the weight of that they would require for you sure you can ask is your board going to weigh in on this because i'm not on the board of directors so, so i can say here's what i think you should be asking your board to decide that's something that you because especially if it's going to affect the shareholders then the board of directors needs to be um thinking that i don't know if either of you have a comment on that but i think you can sort of tell on the topics you're dealing with um, and I have not been in that position of both being a lawyer for the entity and trying to be their advisor, but I can tell you when you're a lawyer, a lot of times you feel like you're an advisor. <laughs> you're dealing with a lot of business issues. A lot of times in the, in the practice that I'm doing, I feel like a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm helping them navigate a business issue as a lawyer, as part of a cross-functional team. So there's a, a blending there, um, but I still feel like at the end of the day, if I'm the only person in the room who has a legal degree, they might ask me to weigh the legal risks and I would help them do that. That's part of what I'm there in the room to do. With malpractice exposure or not? Yeah, yeah, probably so. I don't think but, uh, but I, I feel comfortable with that. I, everybody should carry malpractice insurance because anybody could be sued. Uh, but I think that, uh, like now that I'm an insurance company, I, under, I understand that, that a good insurer will, will totally back you, and if you feel you're doing the right thing, you should all carry on with your practice of law and trying to act like, uh, and trying to combine that if you need to with business advice. Because that's, the, the whole reason all of you are here is if you want to serve on a board, you will not be serving as a lawyer, you will be giving business advice. So embrace that, that where they commingle, um, but do it in a way that you always feel like, yes, these are, I have done, I have done my diligence, I've done my homework, I've thought about the things. But to Michael's point though, do get some financial literacy because that where if you fall down in that capacity, you may not be able to blur the, blend those as much. Yes, go ahead. Thank you uh, for your time. When it came to your first public or private company for appointment, I'm curious whether it's a headhunter reached out to you or somebody you knew reached out to you, what was the reason why they decided it should be you? And they said that you had a certain number of transactions you advised on with one particular client that you worked for, or just you 
was that this event that like why should we do that? I'm curious how that looked like for your first quarter. Well, it's something to I'm sure we're all around. We're going to have I'll a little table. I'll pass that to either of you. Linda, do you want to do that? I mean, I um, yeah. have to admit, it, it wasn't really because I was a lawyer. <laughs> it was, um, you know, first an investor, and then I had management experience running a biotech company, and that was really what brought about the next board opportunity. But I think for, you know, if you are coming from the practice of law, it's because you are filling a need, an, an unmet need that that board has. Um, and, and it's probably something to do with your practice, what, you know, what kind of clients you've had, what kinds of deals you've been doing. So it's really, what does that board need at that time? All right, great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.